Hello, hello and welcome to Compliance Audits, ensuring the viability of a living program. Thank you so much for choosing this topic. My name is Ryan Bray. I have been working with and around RMP PSM regulations for the greater part of 10 years. Um, I wanted to talk today about compliance audits and what inspired me to take this topic and to, to think about this topic. Um, our organization had been giving a training and we had talked about uh, how to deal with regulators during a regulatory audit, um, how to avoid fines, things that you need to look out for. Then afterwards we were talking and he said to me, you know, I don't really even care about our, our federal regulatory audit. It's our internal auditor. She's brutal. She's brutal. And when she comes, it's just, it's just hardcore and you do not want to be caught. You do not want to be caught out of compliance when she comes. The ramifications are horrible. There was all this pain and anxiety. And um, I'm sure that there is a time and a place to be hardcore. I don't want to take away from, from what's going on. But I did think to myself uh, that it was sad that there was a missed opportunity. These compliance audits are meant to meet regulatory standards so that we avoid fines. But they're also a great way to uh, bolster safety culture. When I wrote the white paper to go with this talk, I said here, I, I had read that Louis Gerstner Jr., he's a retired CEO of IBM. He got involved with the company in the early 90s because it was floundering. It wasn't working and uh, his own book says he brought it back from obsolescence. Um, and he talks about there are different strategies. He wrote a book called Who Says Elephants Can't Dance where he goes over how he brought the company back. And one of the main things that he did, although there were others, was auditing, was auditing, was auditing what was going on. And he said in his book, people don't do what you expect, but what you inspect. And I don't think that he originated this phrase. I think we've all heard it. I know I hear it a lot in parenting. If I want my kids to do their homework, um, it's not enough to just say, did you do it? I've got to go through, I've got to check. I got to make sure they did quality work. In the business world, um, I think a lot of times this comes with a negative connotation. We say people don't people don't do what you expect, but what you inspect. But what we mean is that employees won't work hard or won't do what they're supposed to unless you micromanage. But for the purposes of this talk, I'd like to uh, offer the following perspective. I said in order for any safety professional to expect to maintain a program that is both relevant to facility personnel uh, and up to date. It is imperative, imperative to conduct regular inspections to verify intended safety practices reflect current operations and that documentation of evolving protocols is maintained. Um, and that's sort of the, the vein in which I'd like to continue to look at how compliance audits can be used, as I said, to ensure the viability of a living program to make sure that our safety culture is healthy, not just that we meet regulatory requirements. During today's discussion, um, I do want to go over what goes into uh, facilitating a good compliance audit. And that's going to be pretty basic. Uh, if you're new to uh, performing compliance audits, if this is a new job duty, duty for you, then I hope that this will provide a good framework. Um, if this is, uh, if you're a veteran and you've been doing these for a long time, um, then maybe I can provide some points of interest, maybe something to flesh out what you've been doing. Um, we're going to start by looking at the regulatory qu requirements for conducting compliance audits, uh, tips for performing thorough compliance audits. I've broken it into three distinct categories, preparation, implementation and facilitation, and then finally finalization. Um, and what I'm hoping to bring out as we discuss these things is just like we mentioned before, um, I want to bring out how we can turn these into opportunities. And the first thing is, is through that changing audit dynamic, um, looking at things a different way. Speaking of change, the first thing I would like to offer, um, all too often, all too often, uh, when I go to help somebody with an audit, they, uh, I've had several people argue that their original program from the late 90s is good, their process hasn't changed, um, you know, everything's everything's the same, so we're not going to find anything. Things are good. That's probably the biggest red flag that your system doesn't work. If uh, if you've been running off the same program since the 90s, since before the digital age, 
um, what are the chances that you haven't replaced any equipment, that all of your valves are still original, that you haven't had any turnover, that all of your folks, um, you know, have performed everything beautifully and seamlessly for the last 30 years? Um, it's unlikely. So one of the trademark uh, trademark qualities of a plan that is alive, that's 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 reflective of what's currently uh, the, that has good policy is that it's been updated, that it's been changed, that things are not what they used to be. So if you're starting and your documentation is from is from the 1990s, um, it's a good indication that you've got some work ahead of you. All right, well, if you are a uh, PSM coordinator, then you probably know that the, uh, the EPA and OSHA, under their regulations for risk management plans and process safety management. Those are 40 CFR 68 and 29 CFR 1910-119, respectively. Um, both hold requirements that you must uh, audit your program at least every three years. So you must certify evaluation of compliance every three years. Uh, the compliance audit team should include one person that's knowledgeable in the process. Um, I actually get some questions here quite a bit. You need one person who's knowledgeable in the process that's being audited, and that doesn't necessarily have to be the person who's knowledgeable in the process of auditing. We've got a lot of folks who are intimidated by the fact that they've been asked to do an audit because they don't have all the technical information about how the system works. That's just fine. As long as, uh, if this is your job and you've got everything together for how the audit is gonna be conducted and you know how that goes, that's just fine. You can get somebody on your team that's got all the technical background and that's gonna be sufficient to meet uh, both RMP and PSM requirements. Um, your compliance audit, audit you're gonna wanna document your findings, address deficiencies, and then you're gonna wanna retain two of the most recent audit reports that have been conducted. So if you're a veteran, uh, and this is not your first rodeo, you wanna make sure that you've got at least the last two compliance audits on file. Um, they can be destroyed after that point, but I know lots of people who keep them on hand simply because something comes up, litigation, any other kind of finding, something else comes up. You wanna have that documentation. Uh, in the digital age, keeping a file uh, somewhere in your server isn't that, doesn't take up that much space. Uh, so that's something you might want to consider. But according to the regulations, all we need to do is retain the last two audit reports. Okay, in looking at how the compliance audit needs to be conducted, for my own uh, for my own need, I have I've broken them into three different categories. One is preparation, preparing for the audit. This was before any site walk downs or, or anything like that. Um, implementation or facilitation. This includes uh, unit walk downs, facility walk downs, any personnel interviews, um, observing operations, all of that is implementation. And then we get to finalization or documentation. This is where um, as an auditor, we're gonna go ahead and document all of our findings, and then we're gonna develop any necessary recommendations. All right, uh, prep, uh, preparation is the first phase of the compliance audit. It's good to put together a plan about what you're going, what the audit is going to consist of. Make sure you've got all your information together. Um, kind of set the stage for what you're about to do. The first thing you wanna do is take a look at your regulated chemicals. Obviously, for those of you in this audience, uh, I think all of you are going to include uh, ammonia, obviously it's in some way. Um, but that may not be the only one. It may not be the only one. If you've got uh, CO2 on site, some of you have other processes that are also regulated. If you're going to conduct an audit that's going to meet requirements for all of your regulated chemicals, let's identify that up front and, um, and look at all of the information for each of those regulated chemicals. Um, you want to include facility-specific audits and other safety-related policies. If you've had recent process hazards analyses or PHAs, uh, any management of change, incident investigations, start gathering those. Make sure you've got the most current plot plans, process and instrumentation diagrams, PNIDs, uh, 
plot flow diagrams. Uh, this is where you might want to develop a sampling strategy. Um, there's a lot here. If you've got a if you've got a large facility or a large operation, it may not be possible for you to conduct an audit of everything that you've got um, on campus. So, if only a certain portion is going to be audited, and there are guidances for what percentages those need to be, I'm not going to discuss those here. But this is where you'd want to discuss your sampling strategy. If we're only going to do 50% of our operating procedures, if we're only going to if we're only going to interview 25% of our staff, if we're only going to take so many compressors or so many units and because there's so many, we're just going to focus on a, on a few and apply those across the board, this is the time to look at that and to find guidance for what sort of sampling strategy needs to be implemented. Um, also, it's good to look at the schedule. It, again, if you have a large campus and there's going to be certain suites or certain rooms that are going to have uh, equipment down for servicing and those are on the schedule. Let's make sure we know what those are. That way um, we don't go to walk down certain pieces of equipment only to find that they're out. So make sure that your, your schedule works. About three to four weeks prior to the audit, audit, this is when I like to start getting my, start pulling everything together. Um, asset and integrity, asset integrity and reliability manuals. If you have any procedures related to inspection, testing, testing or preventative maintenance, you want to start pulling those for reference. If you've had incidents at your facility, you might want to pull those reports. Um, that way, any deficiencies found in those, you want to make sure that those are highlighted as part of your audit effort. Um, a facility organizational chart. This might seem odd if you've got a small operation, but if you're trying to audit on a large campus and you've got uh, folks from different groups coming together to support your audit, this might be helpful, especially if you have to get approvals from supervisors in different groups for certain people to be involved in the audit. This could be helpful. It's good to have one around. And then copies of safe work practices procedures. This might include uh, hot work, confined space, lockout, tagout. Have those procedures handy for reference. You're going to need them. Uh, you want to bring together your process safety information. Make sure you've got ventilation calculations, upper and lower limits for equipment, uh, safety devices, associated set points. Make sure you've got guidance for PPE requirements. You can double check those in the field. And it might sound odd, um, but you want to have copies of your previous audits, um, both internal and from uh, any federal agency that might have come by. If you have identified deficiencies in audits before, um, they might make good points to focus on in your current audit. Make sure they've been rectified. Make sure they've been changed. Um, if those deficiencies are still there, then maybe it's time to um, increase the uh, increase the priority, increase the priority on those areas. All right. Then getting a little closer, two to three weeks prior to the audit, it's time to put together a schedule, an agenda. We've talked about uh, making sure that certain equipment is going to be available to you, that it won't be down for maintenance when you want to do your site walk down. We've talked about personnel interviews. We've talked about maybe having to get supervisory approval to let folks um, join the audit team. Um, having an agenda allows proper personnel to attend, allows them to clear their schedule, get coverage if they need coverage for the line, for the floor, um, allows people to check in, all right, from this hour, from this time to this time, I'm going to need extra folks uh, so that we can complete our compliance audit. It's critical to give folks that time. So do yourself a favor, two to three, two to three weeks ahead of time, get an agenda together, allow this, uh, you know, disseminate the schedule, let people make, uh, make arrangements so they can join your audit team. Uh, develop a comprehensive plan. Know what your sampling methodologies are going to be ahead of time. Have a list of the people to be interviewed, the equipment to be walked down, the list of records to be reviewed. Kind of, you can you can sort of 
show what kind of time you're going to need to spend on it. If you're answering to a corporate uh, a corporate uh, entity and they want to know, all right, how much is this going to cost? What are you going to spend on this? If you've got your plan in place, you can say, look, this is going to take me X amount of hours to complete. This is my estimate based on what I have to review. I have all that stuff ahead of time. It's going to be it's going to make your documentation process at the end a whole lot easier as well. All right. Pre auditing. I cannot stress how much I love this before you actually start. So one week ahead of time. So we've had the two to three weeks. You've got everybody. They're all looking for it. But the pre audit is for the auditor. Um, you're going to cut a lot of time, a lot of effort, making sure that you do this pre audit one week prior. And this is where you go through your PSM program elements to see that everything's in place. Does everything make sense? Is everything there and accounted for? Um, this will highlight if there's something that doesn't make sense to you, if there's something that doesn't look right, or maybe you have experience on the floor and you know that things aren't being conducted like it says in the plan. These can be made focus points during your walk down portions of the audit. Um, it's Again, having these things cleared and knowing you don't have to ask certain questions because some things are there and accounted for, this is going to reduce the time and effort associated with the implementation portion of the audit. And it gives you some background. If this isn't something that you're looking at every day, you're not on the floor, it can kind of be a great way to get your, your head in the right space to ask the right questions so that you can get the most out of your audit. So don't skip this part. Do your pre-auditing. Go through the plan before you actually do your equipment, your facility walk down. You're going to be glad you did. This is also something I want to point out. This is something really good to be thinking of during the pre-audit phase. Um, we've done entire segments on this about the life cycle of a recommendation. This is a great way to determine from a documentation standpoint whether the plan is living and whether it's being used. For example, if you take a process hazard analysis, a PHA, it's something else that has recommendations that come out of it. Recommendations. Um, they have sort of a life cycle to them. Uh, one of the things is that if you, for example, let's take, a, let's say you might have a recommendation which requires a management of change. What you want to do, you know, you've, you've changed the system a little bit, whatever, that's the recommendation. If it's been completed, you need to, re, you need to complete a, a management of change. If the management of change includes changes in the equipment, there should be new process safety information. Um, this might be in the form of a revised PNID. Uh, if these steps have been taken and the recommendation has been closed out, um, is there documentation of a pre-startup safety review? Uh, if, it, if necessary, has training been conducted? So if you take a look at your process hazard analysis and you find a recommendation that should have these, um, these sort of ripple effects, follow it through. See if the MOC has been completed check the process safety information to see if those have been there. If there has been a change in the system, have the PNIDs been updated to reflect that? If we had to shut it down uh, and then it was restarted, is there products pre-startup safety review documentation? Was there training if this changed anything to do with the operating process? See if all those pieces are there. If they're not, it's an indicator that, uh, that the ball was dropped somewhere. And this might be something to figure out where was the ball dropped. Maybe this is an opportunity for education. Maybe this is a time for us to go back over our processes and make sure that they're in place so that all of these things happen. If they are in place, if the, if the documentation looks good, you can pat yourself on the back. You now have proof that the plan, at least in some respects, is viable and is working. Okay, implementation. Um, this is the actual audit process. This is where you get folks together. I like to start with a kickoff meeting. Uh, it's not required as part of the regulation, but I feel like it's helpful. Um, if you've provided folks with an agenda so they can clear their schedule, if there's any part of that that's missing, it's good to bring that planning and agenda. If there are any conflicts or things change, this might be a time for people to voice those, save you some time uh, down the road. Um, if you're the auditor and you're not somebody who's in their faces all the time, if you're not on the floor, 
If it's a large campus, uh, they may not know you. It might be a good time to introduce yourself. If you're bringing in any third party support, it might be a good day to introduce them so there aren't uh, new faces coming in asking them probing questions later on. Um, you can start that introduction there. Um, if you have if you're separating or delegating any portion of the process, if you're getting help, it's good to identify the personnel responsible for uh, specific program elements. You can discuss the timeline, methods of communication. Again, if you have a large campus, if folks come into a meeting and then they have thoughts later, how do they get those comments to you? Do they need to go through a supervisor or central modes of communication? Have all of that worked out ahead of time. Um, Again, we were talking about here, like if there's a limited access, you have to gain those access. This might be a good time to work that out. Who do you need to contact? Who else needs to be involved? Even if it's not the person who's going to be involved in your equipment walk down or maybe the person that you're going to be interviewing. If there's a third party, a supervisor, somebody in that role um, that's got to be able to work out those lines of communication ahead of time. All right, and here the unit walk down, the audit is, is started for certain. Um, when you're going to go walk down your facility, uh, you want to make sure that you have the most current uh, PNIDs um, and you want to be checking for accuracy as you go through. This is how this pipe runs. Is it there? Is everything connecting the way it should? Great. Uh, you might want to just observe for a while. Uh, to see the technicians working, to see if they, um, if you've got those those operating procedures handy, you can kind of check and see, does this look like things are aligning with what's written on the page as the way they're actually being implemented in the field? Um, this is a good time to get employee participation, uh, discussing the overall safety program with your guide, whoever's walking you down. How does this work? Uh, this is a safety feature. PPE, is it being worn in this area? How is that working? You know, is it getting in the way of, you know, asking some questions like, does it get in the way of productivity? But yeah, sometimes we can't. Oh, hold on. We need to be wearing PPE. We can work this out later. But you'll you'll keep all of that, keep all of that, uh, the recommendation portion separate. Just, oh yeah, sometimes it's difficult for folks to wear their PPE and get this done. We'll deal with that later. Discuss maintenance issues. Um, if we do have an overpressure, if we do have an issue with the system, how does that go down? Who makes the call? Where's the lines of communication? Walk them through a scenario. It's a great way to get some feedback as to whether the people are actually following operating procedures. Personnel interviews. Um, this should be a combination. We were just talking about talking to your guide, and I think that that's great. You're going to get a lot of candid, this is how it's going, you know. Uh, lots of hand gestures and things showing this is where this is where this happens and this is how we do this. That's all great. Um, I think that should be combined with some actual traditional one-on-one -on -one, uh, personnel interviews. I've put in some notes here. Um, I think just from a from a auditor standpoint, I think it's good to use a standardized questionnaire with open-ended answers. One standardized questions because. If you come in and you're asking different questions for different uh, personnel, you're going to get input on a lot of different areas and you'll be basing your recommendations on perhaps one or uh, one person's um, opinion of a certain issue. But if you ask standardized questions, then you can get several perspectives on the same issue. You can kind of determine what the actual what the reality is of whatever that question is about based on the range of responses that you get. Um, I suggest open-ended questions rather than yes, no, or short answer because it forces the person to explain things in their own terms um, with less leading. You know, oh, do you wear your safety goggles when you do this? Yes, that doesn't work. Hey, what happens? Walk me through the procedure when you do the oil letting. How does that work? Tell me what you normally do. Um, and that way they have to explain it to you and you can get much better input that way, much more, much better input. Again, we talked about sample sizing. Um, if you've got a large staff, you're not going to be able to do uh, interviews with all of them. Choose ahead of time, make sure that you've got a good number of operators and maintenance personnel um, involved in your personnel interviews. Something that I've got up here, um, which since putting this together, I've realized is not possible 
for all facilities. But if you can provide um, a level of anonymity for folks, I feel like this might be good for getting some real candid responses when folks are not concerned that their name's gonna be plastered. Hey, my supervisor makes this tough uh, for this reason, or oh, this isn't working and needs to be repaired, but I know that they don't wanna put it in the budget. Um, whatever it is, if we can give them some anonymity, you might help, it might help get some really good, uh, some good feedback, um, some open dialogue, just something where they're not going to be worried. They're not going to be worried about um, how this is going to affect them afterwards. If they're not following operating procedures, but they think what they do is better, or they think they need to grow better, if they're not worried about that turning around and being some sort of um, disciplinary action because of what they're doing, um, it might be helpful to get a real, to, to actually get the real information about what's happening um, when there, there aren't any fear of, of repercussions. Again, for all companies, that's not possible. Um, one of the thoughts I was having was that for very small facilities, you, everybody works in too close quarters for folks not to know who said what. Um, so sometimes that's not always the possibility, and sometimes there are corporate policies against that. Um, they want to know, and if that's the case and you're working with that, that's fine. But if possible, it might be helpful. So I wanted to I wanted to offer that for you. All right, implementation worksheets. Um, you don't need to use worksheets, but I find that they are helpful. Um, when we conduct audits, we uh, go through a series of worksheets that have um, provide all of the regulatory verbiage so I know exactly what regulation I need to meet. And then it includes uh, a space for me to denote my findings and then a place for me to make recommendations. Um, usually these are separated between program elements just for better organization to keep things together. I find for me that this is a really great system. Uh, this is an example that you're looking at of a worksheet that we might use here in our office. As you can see, there's an ID number. This is obviously the operating procedure section and our first element. You can make as many as you want. Uh, we list the regulatory reference for both the EPA, EPA and OSHA. Uh, this client was obviously in California. We've got different California regulations. If those don't apply, obviously just uh, don't worry about those. And then we have the, the language from the requirement. After that, we've got, uh, did they meet it? Did they not? Yes, no, P for partial, and A for not, uh, not applicable. We can put, after that in the next field, we can put our findings, recommendations. Here's an example of one that's been filled out. Uh, the requirement here is that the owner operator shall develop and implement written operating procedures that provide clear instructions. Um, did they do it partially? And then comments. We Here's our sampling. 15 of 30 procedures were reviewed. That's 50%. Um, eight of the 15 demonstrated deviations from the written procedure. Uh, during the interview with operators, most operators concurred that changes have been made to procedures in the field. This is our finding. And that's really interesting. Again, we've talked about finding versus recommendation. This is a statement about what's happening. 50% were reviewed. Eight of the 15 showed deviations. Most operators concurred that these deviations have been made, period, we're done. Then we can make a recommendation, ensure that all written procedures um, in use at the facility accurately reflect procedures performed by operating personnel. This might be an example of, of a completed worksheet. Um, Finalization, this is the beginning of the end. Uh, this might be part of implementation, depending on how you look at it. It's good to have a closeout meeting. You can review what your findings have been with the audit team and your participants. If you need to bring in management, this might be the time. You can review the findings and then uh, provide sort of draft recommendations. I, I would have you consider uh, including sort of pre-filling out recommendations before you get to this meeting, it might help speed things along when people have something to work with. Um, use it, consider reviewing all written procedures in use at the facility to confirm they accurately reflect procedures performed by operation personnel. This is actually sort of a, a week um, 
a weak recommendation, but that's fine. These can all be fleshed out during the review. Uh, something that you might want to might want to do something like this, where it says ensure that all written procedures in use at the facility accurately reflect procedures performed. Uh, just some tips for auditors. I don't like to use the term ensure. Um, when you ensure something, it means that there's no um, there's no room for error. You're still going to have to fill out this. You're still going to have to complete this recommendation based on RMP PSM recommendations. So you're not getting out of it, but when you have a regulator looking at this, I like to word these in such a way that give me some room. Consider implementing reviews of all written procedures. That's different than ensuring that all written procedures are written accurately. Is that you consider reviewing them, uh, all the ones that are in use, if any procedures noted as inaccurate by the review team should be updated following typical facility operation procedures developing policies. As part of this recommendation, a list of verified and updated procedures should be compiled and approved by an operations supervisor. This is a much stronger recommendation. It doesn't have that uh, language that boxes you in, ensure all written procedures um, are updated. This says consider implementing reviews. So you have, let's go through review process. If we find that there are any discrepancies, we will, um, we will update them. Something that's better about this one that the other didn't have is that it's signed off by an operations supervisor, which means you can verify that this work has been done. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it rides that balance much better of not boxing you in. If for some reason during your next audit, not all of your procedures have been completed, but you've done a fair few of them, you can uh, show demonstrated progress. I can guarantee you your regulator is going to be happier with that then by looking at a recommendation that says I'm going to do all of this and it's not completed. So that's just food for thought uh, when you're thinking about how you're going to conduct your, your closeout meeting and how you're going to um, organize uh, your written recommendations. All right, finalization. Report development. Um, we always suggest that you include an executive summary. This should include the number of finding, the deficiencies, recommendations, your methodology. You want to outline all of those. If we know that we're only going to do 50% of uh, any of your sampling, there you go, sampling. If you're only going to do a certain percentage of your equipment because you have such a large facility, let's talk about it. Um, if you're adhering to federal requirements, let's write those out. If you have state requirements, I know we have those in California, there's some in Nevada. Louisiana, New Jersey, I think a couple places. Let's identify those. We're meeting these requirements as well. Include the names of the people on the audit team, as well as any interviewees, um, and the documents reviewed. Spell it out. That way, anybody looking at this can show, okay, they've done a thorough review. This is what was included. If for anything, if for any reason things were omitted, you can see, oh, well, that wasn't included as part of the audit. That's why those comments are not present. I just think it's good. It's good. It's good uh, report development. For all of your recommendations, make sure you have assigned an individual who is responsible for following up. Who's going to make sure to see it to completion? You can assign an estimated date of completion to each recommendation to give yourself a projected timeline. In California, audit recommendations need to be resolved within one and a half years, according to 19 CCR 2755.6 Section D. Although that requirement is not held at the federal level, our firm considers it a best practice and typically encourages facilities to close out their recommendations within about two years. For any action taken to resolve a recommendation, label them as closed, especially for documentation recommendations. If you can update your documentation right there while you're preparing the report, you can label them as closed even before you have finalized the audit process. And that should look pretty good to your regulator to show them that recommendations have already been closed out. Okay, I did want to wrap this up. Uh, we've gone through the preparation, 
the implementation, the facilitation, and the documentation. If you've done all those things, this is good. But through this process, um, we again, the goal is to ensure the viability of a living program. Your compliance audit needs to meet the regulatory requirements. Having these worksheets, making sure, I, I was thinking back to the, the colleague, you do want that internal auditor to come in and really do a thorough auto, uh, audit. You really want them to pull out where the deficiencies are. Um, but you want to address the effectiveness of the program and keeping that, keeping that attitude in mind that I'm looking for opportunities for improvement, I'm looking for training opportunities, I'm looking for ways that my staff may have improved on our uh, operating procedures, but perhaps have failed in the documentation portion of it. Let's look at ways that we can encourage this. Um, encouraging an open dialogue with the operations and management staff, keeping things anonymous if possible, being open, realizing that this is, this is here to support safety culture rather than uh, be a reason for disciplinary action. Um, it's a good way to identify shifts in operational norms and documentation. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, just because something doesn't adhere to the written documentation doesn't mean that it's wrong. A lot of times we're doing things because they make more sense. People come in and they have new ideas. It doesn't mean that they're sloughing off and not doing the work like they need to. It may mean that our documentation needs to be updated to reflect those norms. Maybe we have better ideas now. Um, are we looking to see that all portions of the plan have been updated? Just like I mentioned with the, with the PHA, and this works for the compliance audit as well. If we've got a recommendation that's closed out, there are ripple effects, training that has to be done, SOPs that have to be updated, um, management of changes that need to be documented. There might be some changes in, in a couple of other fields. Are those being done? Is the plan evolving? If your plan's evolving, um, there's a good chance that it, it truly is a living document, that it's something that's useful, that's working. If it's stagnating, then it's time to, to really pull out it and see what can be done. 